As archaeologists, we are concerned with the past, with uncovering the ancient remains and seeking to understand what they can tell us about our ancestors. But as archaeologists, we are also concerned with the future, with protecting and preserving what we uncover so that future generations of our descendants will be able to benefit and learn from our discoveries. Both uncovering and protecting Zagora's cultural heritage is therefore central to our work on Andros. And in this presentation, I therefore want to share something with you of the cons conservation work that we are undertaking. Our conservation work concerns both movable and immovable finds. Now, what I mean by movable finds is literally what we can take off the site. So you've heard lots about the pottery of different kinds today. Those are movable finds. There's also bronze artifacts, um, metal artifacts, uh, stone artifacts of a reasonably small uh, dimension and so on. And you can see here uh, some example, an example of movable finds being conserved <coughs> by our finds conservator, Dr. Wendy Reed. And she's working on fragments of that great pithos that you've heard mentioned a few times today that came from D26, Trench 7. Um, you see it in the ground at the top left there. You see it in Wendy's capable hands in the middle and some of the uh, reattached pieces sitting in a sandbox uh, while, they, while they dry, while the glue dries. Now that pithos, as you've already heard today, would have been at its widest part over a meter in diameter and would originally have weighed somewhere between two and 300 kilos. So with a movable find of this dimension, movable really only because it's broken, with a movable find of that dimension, one of our dilemmas is going to be whether we reconstruct the whole vessel or as much of the vessel that we have fragments for. Because given its size, that would not only be a very difficult task in itself, but requ would require a large amount of exhibition or storage space. And certainly, as those of you who've been to the Andros Museum storerooms, and there's quite a number of team members in this room who've done that, you will know that the Andros Archaeological Museum is pretty stuffed to the gills already. So that decision as to where for, whether um, to put this extraordinary vessel back together, and of course we all want to do that, we all want to see what it would have looked like intact, is a decision that has to be taken in conjunction with the director of the Archaeological Museum on Andros, the EFOR. And if we were to do that, I'm sure that it would also <coughs> require probably a good amount of fundraising uh, that went along with it, uh, perhaps in order to uh, supply some extra space. I can't pass over this slide, though, without pointing out Wendy's apron. I do love it. Been there. B-E-A-N, Beatrice. <laughs> Dug that. Now, immovable heritage is the site itself and its architecture. And that is an even more challenging uh, job to conserve and protect than the movable finds that I've spoken of already. And when we're thinking about the immovable heritage that has to remain on the site at Zagara, we have a number of possible alternatives to choose between when we think about how to protect and conserve the architecture. Now, one way that we can deal with the architecture on the site is to rebury it to backfill, 
because if we backfill the trenches once they have been dug in a very particular way, and I'll talk about that in a minute, then those structures are secure. They're not subject to uh, the threat of nature, which I'll talk about uh, in a little while. They're not subject to uh, the years going by and a huge amount of maintenance is needed for these structures once they're exposed to that maintenance for one reason or another not being able to be supplied. So backfilling is, in fact, a very good uh, solution for parts of the site. And you can see in the slide here, on the left-hand side there, one of the rooms before, as it was excavated uh, under Professor Cambitoglou's team, and how today Area B, more generally, looks with those remains buried under the earth. We know where they are. We know what they look like. We've got the record. We've got the plans. The planning and the recording in detail, of course, is absolutely crucial if a structure is going to be reburied. And those uh, remains are now safely back under the earth again. When we came to the end of our three-year excavation period uh, between 2012 and 2014, this was the method that we chose to employ for what we had uncovered in those three years. There are a number of reasons for that, not least because in a number of the trenches we have not yet finished uncovering and excavating, and the whole process of conserving ancient remains above the ground needs very careful consideration and thought about how you're going to do that, what the solutions are going to be. And quite rightly, it requires the official permission of the Greek Ministry of Culture. We don't have that possibility within an excavation season to go through all of those processes and get that permission. So in October, uh, late October, beginning of November 2014, what we did in each of the seven areas that we had been working on uh, was to undertake a huge job. I don't think any of us had actually realized just quite how huge the job of reburying those structures was going to be, at least for the time being. Now, you can't simply just throw the earth back in, because if you do that, 50 years down the line, 100 years, 500 years down the line, in the future, when archaeologists of other generations, future generations, come back to the site, yes, they will know where those trenches are. They're marked very clearly on the plans that we've made. But the horizon to which we arrived at in digging down through the earth will not be marked. So before any soil can be, brought, uh, can be thrown back into these structures, what has to be done is to create that artificial horizon that shows where we reached in investigating those buildings. So you basically have to package wrap the trench, the structure, before you can bury it, rebury it. And you can see in the slide in the bottom right-hand corner the treatment that we gave to uh, the trench that you've heard quite a lot about, the trench that was situated at the extreme end of the uh, south end of the site, a trench... Uh, supervised by Dr. Paul Donnelly, where we had that freestanding two-room structure M1 and M2. And what we had to do with each of those rooms was to line them with a special kind of artificial material, something called geotextile, that is not, as the years go by, going to easily break down. Because once you bury something in the earth, an organic material will break down. So this is a kind of material that's used in agriculture that has a much longer lifespan than a, a regular organic material. So we had to line the trench with this geotextile and then 
in certain areas where there were sensitive structures that we were reburying, such as, I, oh, wrong way. I don't know if you remember um, in this building that we had a bench in the room that uh, Professor Miller was talking about that may have only been partially roofed on one side. This is under that white cover is the bench. And we covered that and then we built a protective wall and capping of field stones around it so that when we threw the soil back in, there was uh, protection for that structure in, uh, what we, in the soil that we threw back in and reburied. And as I say, it was a huge, a huge undertaking. Now, the disadvantage of reburying structures is that although it protects the ancient buildings, it makes the ancient structural landscape invisible to visitors. So in terms of our responsibilities to what we call public archaeology, in allowing what we have uncovered and discovered to be visible and understandable by others, uh, in the future and by members of the general public, backfilling really fails in a major way. So it's got its advantages and its disadvantages. And I show you here that very same trench indeed um, at the southern end of the site with Paul Donnelly in the very stylish orange jacket. <laughs> Red. Red. Oh. <laughs> <Sorry>. Red. <laughs> major faux pas. Um, standing in uh, one of those rooms and talking with the local visitors who we invited. We invited members of the Andrea community to come and visit the site, and they came. And he's talking to them about the discoveries that we made there. Now, of course, that's gone. It's been reburied. So really, in thinking holistically about the site, the best approach that we can take in order to satisfy the requirements of site conservation and of public archaeology, of public information, of public education, is therefore to combine the reburying of some structures with the stabilization and conservation of others that are allowed to remain above the ground. Now, with those structures that remain above ground, the greatest threat to them comes from nature. Nature is no respecter of antiquity. That threat comes from animals, especially goats and sheep uh, at Zagora that, uh, when we're not there, come in and clamber all over our precious buildings. The threat also comes from plant growth of various kinds. I just show you here a couple of the most prevalent <coughs> kinds of plant growth on the site. The prinos, which is this prickly, um, sort of prickly oak plant that invades, it loves growing on rock piles because there's a good depth of soil underneath it, unlike most of the rest of Zagara, which has very thin soil cover. Its roots, in fact, penetrate down into the ancient structures, and all the team members present in this room will very happily tell you, in probably very colorful language, how much they hated that <coughs> shrub, because the roots were almost impossible to get rid of, no matter how deep you dug. And then more superficially, but no less damaging to the exposed remains, are. Ooh, are the, uh, the asphodels, these beautiful plants that grow on the site. They have a bulb that they grow out of, and they penetrate into uh, the stones between the, the ancient buildings, the stones that are part of those structures, and break those apart. There's also, I haven't got a side of it here, but there's also a much less damaging plant, which uh, is a lovely one, and perhaps would have come into the ancient cooking, Beatrice, yes. the saffron, the saffron crocus, uh, which uh, appears on the site at a very particular date every October. 
And then there's also the threat of water. And the climate in Greece, just as here in Australia, can be very uh, subject to sudden changes and fierce downpours of water. And when that water comes, unless the structures, the exposed structures are protected from the flow of that water, there can be damage to them. Now, when Professor Cambidlu and his team excavated at Zagora in the 1960s and the 1970s, they took three different approaches to the architectural conservation of the site in that day. And I feel rather nervous talking about this um, uh, because there are, Professor Cam Bitterglue and a number of the earlier team members are here and I am more than willing to stand corrected on any errors I make uh, by those present. So forgive me if I make those errors. So they took three different approaches to the conservation of the site. And the first of those, as we saw in an earlier slide, was backfilling parts of the site, reburying areas of the excavations they conducted. A second and also very effective conservation approach was to clad the walls of the excavated domestic structures in what we refer to as areas D and H on the, essentially the top, uh, the central top area uh, of the site at Zagora, to clad those structures with a mantle of stones. And what I mean by that, you can see very clearly in this top left-hand side, the ancient walls of these thinner areas that you can see running down the middle of the walls uh, as they appear in these images. The cladding is the layers that run around that have been up, built up against the ancient walls and also which came to cover the tops of those walls. So you've got the walls, the ancient walls, absolutely protected within this stone packaging that's constructed around them. And that approach to conserving the site has been highly effective. I show you in the bottom right-hand slide exactly the same view today taken um, I think, in, I think I took this in 2013, taken of exactly that same view that you see in the top left there. And the stones, okay, they perhaps don't look quite as neat as they did in the 1970s, but essentially they're still there. And the walls, the ancient walls are protected inside. Nothing has fallen down. Everything is still there. And although the visitor to the site can't see precisely the ancient buildings themselves, what the visitor does get is a good idea of the general layout of those structures. Yes, the walls look much fatter, but there is a very good three-dimensional impression given to the visitor of what those buildings, uh, the routes through them, the access uh, between rooms and so on. And you can see here another example of that same conservation approach that was taken in the 60s and 70s by Professor Cambitoglou's team in areas D and H, where again, you've got the ancient walls in the middle of the stone cladding that surrounds it on each side, and then a stone capping being placed over the top. And again, a present day view of that same area. A third method of protecting the excavated structures that, that um, Professor Cambitoglou's team took was to treat those structures that it was decided to leave exposed above ground to treat those by capping the walls with 
large stones. So just as you saw in the previous examples of the cladding technique, the sides of the walls, the lateral sides of the walls, were not surrounded with stone, but the tops of the walls were covered in large stones to protect them from the animals. <coughs> and this was a, a method that was adopted particularly for the houses, the ancient houses in Area J, and in, uh, also for the temple. Now that method was most effective in terms of the public archaeology of the site. Because after they had finished their work in the 1970s, visitors could go along to the site and have a very good understanding of what the buildings, the ancient buildings, looked like. And I show you uh, a section of the J houses as excavated in the 60s and 70s there. So from the point of public archaeology, it was great. The natural threats, though, were no respecter of public archaeology. And the goats and the sheep, over the decades that followed, scrambling across the remains, meant that a number of those capping stones became dislodged, fell out of place. <coughs> And in terms of the vegetation growth, that that was able, over time, to move back in. And so what I show you in the right-hand slide is exactly the same excavation area that you have on the left, as it appeared by the time we went back to the site in 2012. And you can see that nature has taken hold in a very major way. Another example, uh, again in the J area, I show you here of rooms J10 and J11 approached from J9 as they were excavated by Professor Kambitoglu's team. And then again, the state uh, in which they, uh, we found them when we went back to the site in 2012. Now, clearly, a whole 40-plus years had passed since those original excavations. And it was clear to us and to the archaeological service that reconservation, a revisited conservation program, was required for particular area J, particular, uh, in particular area J, the temple, and also the gate through the ancient fortification wall, which had also been left above ground. As part, therefore, of the three-year fieldwork program permit that was granted to us by the Greek Ministry of Culture for 2012 to 2014, the Zagora Archaeological Project was required to undertake, first of all, an evaluative conservation study of the site for submission to the Central Archaeological Council in Athens. The Central Archaeological Council in Athens is the decision-making body of the Greek Ministry of Culture where archaeological monuments are concerned. Now that is not something that uh, Meg or Stavros or Beatrice or myself could do. You have to be a professional conservator in order to undertake such a study, and indeed an architectural conservator. So we needed a specialist. And I knew just the woman for the job. Now, the woman for the job was uh, somebody with whom, as a postgraduate student in Athens in the 1980s, I'd misspent part of my youth with which is always good because you can always go back. You've got a bit of leverage in terms of the naughtiness that you shared at the time and the fond memories that uh, you now have of those earlier days. The lady concerned, you've heard her name before this morning, it was Dr. Steffi Kluveraki. Uh, 
And in the meantime, she had become, when I knew her in Athens in the 1980s, she was studying conservation at Athens University. And in the meantime, she had gained her uh, doctorate in architectural conservation. She had become the head conservator for the American uh, Institute for Aegean Prehistory on Crete and had worked on many, many different sites conserving their archaeological remains. And she'd also become, I don't know how she does it, she seems to manage several jobs all at once. She'd also become a lecturer in architectural conservation at the University of Athens. So given all that, we weren't quite sure whether she was going to take on our request to produce uh, an evaluative conservation study for Zagora. But we approached her and she expressed a very keen interest indeed. And so she set about this huge job of reviewing the whole site and looking at its conservation needs. And you can see her here uh, on site in 2014 with Stavros and with the new ambassador, the new Australian ambassador to Athens, Dr. Uh, John Griffin, who very kindly came to visit the site. And also, I'll talk about these other individuals in a minute, uh, Rahan Sharon Guivel and uh, Kostis Fragiadakis and Dimitris Fakianakis sitting down there. They didn't often do that, <laughs> any of those three. It's a very unusual photo. In 2013, Steffi's conservation study, and when I say conservation study, I mean a book-length document. It was quite extraordinary. Her conservation study was submitted to the Central Archaeological Council in Athens. And several months later, once it had wound its way through the various uh, committees, was approved. And in 2014, when we were there in October uh, last year, the work of actually implementing her conservation proposals began. Now, as I mentioned before, the three areas of the site that require most reconservation are the above ground remains of the temple, the archaic temple in the middle of the site, area J, the houses in area J, and not in this side, but uh, off over uh, to the east, is the gateway, the ancient gateway through the fortification wall. The conservation that began in October 2014 I must say, is only the beginning. It's part of a multi-year conservation program that will run for about eight weeks per year, uh, certainly this year, and I'm sure next year, and depending on how far the conservation has got by then, it will continue. We basically have to keep going until all of these structures have been reconserved. That conservation program is costly. The two gentlemen who were sitting down, Kostis Fragiavakis and Dimitris Fakianakis, are experts in their own right. They are technicians, architectural conservation technicians who come from Crete. We need to cover their wages, their living costs. We need to cover the costs of our head conservator, Dr. Hluvaraki, and we need to cover the costs of the materials. And all of these materials have to be brought into the site. And Zagora, as I'm sure all of you know, is an incredibly remote site. And we can't simply drive our supplies of cement and sand uh, and whatever else is needed to the site. They all have to be brought in, either by donkey or on the back of the conservators. And the costs involved have to be met outside of our funding from the Australian Research Council. The Australian Research Council funding that we received for the 2012-2014 uh, program 
is for new research. And you certainly can't expect a National Funding Council in Australia to be funding the conservation of another nation's national heritage. So we have uh, quite a job because we have to raise the funds that are required, either, well, both, by making grants to other bodies to whom that kind of a request is eligible. We are in the process uh, now of making such an application to an American funding body, but that would only, if we get it, that would only cover one year's conservation at most. And also trying to privately raise funds. And certainly the program of conservation that we put together, uh, that we began in 2014, was funded from private donations. Donations that had come to the Archaeological Institute here for work at Zagora. And that was absolutely critical, fundamental, and very, very greatly appreciated. The costs involved are in the region of something like 20,000 euros per year. And unfortunately, now the dollar's gone down. That's a lot of dollars. I said I'd talk a little bit more about the team of people who, uh, which is involved with that conservation program. At the top there, you have uh, Costis and Dimitris, who, as I mentioned, come from Crete, and they are truly characters. They arrived in 2014 on Andros in Dimitris' trusty four-wheel drive, because to get even anywhere remotely close to the site, that is the kind of vehicle that's needed. But that four-wheel drive vehicle came not only to assist in at least getting somewhere a little bit closer to the site, all the supplies that were needed for the conservation, but it came loaded to Andros with supplies from Crete that were meant for human team consumption. They arrived, not with Pithoi, I'm afraid, Beatrice, but they arrived with metal containers full of Cretan oil, Cretan raki, which is a fearsome alcohol that they had brewed. And believe it or not, that I could kind of get my head around. Meat. They brought their own meat. It was quite extraordinary. <laughs> And when supplies ran out, they called their wives and asked them to send more. They also came with a generator because the site being so remote means that we have no source of power available to us unless we can generate it there in situ. So they had brought a generator, a petrol um, generator with them because in order to mix the concrete for the post bases that I'll talk about later, they needed some way to mix the concrete. You also have, down in the bottom slide, sitting, uh, learning literally at the, at the feet of Steffi, Rahan, Sharon Guivel, and Jane McMahon. <coughs> and the great thing about this conservation program is that what we hope is happening, and I'm looking directly at Rahan as I say this, is that we're training the, conserv the conservators of the future. Steffi is a wonderful instructor and very generous with her knowledge. And she asked us, um, right from the beginning of her involvement with the project, to allocate to her one or two people who had a burning interest in conservation, who she would then train up and work with hopefully throughout the life of the conservation program at the site. And both Jane and Rahan put their hand up for this task and have been absolutely invaluable in the work that we've conducted at the site so far. Um, I have to say that although that was the core team of Steffi, uh, Costis, Dimitris, uh, uh, Rahan and Jane in 2013, we also very much depended on Steve Vasilakis, um, who became a great mate 
of the Cretan, our Cretan technicians and the go-to men whenever there was something that they needed and they weren't sure where they could get it or how it could be done. And those three brains together, I tell you, if I was lost in a jungle, I would want to be with those three men because you would survive. They could conjure extraordinary um, techniques and ways of doing things out of nothing. Dr. Hugh Thomas, uh, who's been mentioned before for his extraordinary aerial photography and other kinds of photography, was very important together with Anne Houghton, who's responsible for that drawing on your T-shirt, uh, 2014 T-shirt. They were very instrumental in creating the documentation that both Steffi and the Central Archaeological Council needs for the uh, conservation program to proceed because before the work can be done, the existing state of the buildings has to be recorded. And we've been doing this via a combination of Hugh's photography and Annie's drawing. The conservation process began first at the, the request of the Greek Ministry of Culture on the Archaic Temple. And it has a number of steps that have to be uh, pursued. So first of all, of course, the vegetation has to be removed. That quite thick growth of plant life has to be stripped. And it has to be stripped carefully so that the plants that are growing into the walls are removed in such a way that they do not damage the structures. There then needs to be a very detailed work of comparing the existing state of the structures to their state as they were originally excavated in the 1960s and the 1970s. And that's where the work of Annie Houghton and Hugh Thomas uh, was extraordinary valu uh, extraordinarily valuable. And also Rahan spent hours and days and weeks examining the photographs from the old excavations, and the, the photographic record from the old excavations is tremendous, I have to say, comparing that record with what is there on site today. Now, one of the, or the, the main reason for doing that is to be able to try and identify where stones have fall, ancient stones from the structures have fallen out of place, which is inevitably the case for a number of these buildings, to be able to identify those from the hundreds of stones lying around on the ground and to replace those into the ancient buildings. So imagine you're doing a 10,000-piece jigsaw puzzle or something and you're looking for one piece. It's a bit like that. At the point at which the team was ready to start replacing ancient stones into the structures and to stabilize the standing remains themselves. A special mortar had to be mixed. Now that special mortar, its constituents had had to be examined, uh, the, the paperwork for it had to be examined by the Central Archaeological Council. Steffi had put together, if you like, a recipe that uh, went to the council for approval. And it was essentially a recipe that was intended when used on the site to stabilize the buildings to the greatest possible degree, but to make the modern intervention look as least intrusive as possible. For that reason, she tried as far as she could to use local materials. So the mortar which was created, uh, as you would expand, expect, from sand, cement, uh, and earth, was comprised of earth that was local to the site, of sand that was local to the site, and then a, white, a very small percentage of white cement. And it had to be measured, as you can see here in these slides, it had to be measured very um, accurately. So Rahan's weighing as Jane's pouring in there. And then it had to be mixed. 
and applied in between the ancient stones, the faces of the ancient walls, where there are gaps that threaten the stability. Now, in doing this, we're not actually doing anything that the ancients themselves didn't do. Because in constructing the ancient buildings at Zagora, the ancients were using an earth mortar. And those of you who've uh, worked on the site will know that if you peer inside the walls, you can still see that mortar in place. It's disappeared from the faces and the stones near to the face of the walls because of weathering. So in essence, although this time with a very small percentage um, of white cement, we are refilling the gaps in the walls that would, when they were new, have been uh, filled up with earth mortar. There was also a job, oh, and I, yeah, some slides here that I've put in to show you uh, Rahan and Jane and Steffi uh, at work here, putting that mortar into the faces and the tops of the walls to stabilize those stones in situ. And then uh, to show you this little pilot stretch of the wall uh, as it was finished how it appeared. Another task that had to be undertaken was the laying of what you might call a mortared clearway around the structures. As you can see with the temple, this was done around about a, um, Raham, what was it, about a meter or so? Half a meter, thank you half a meter around the building, a mortared surface was laid. And that was laid for two purposes. It was laid for the reason that it will be much harder for the plant growth to re-encroach onto the building through or across that mortared surface. And also because it's been given a slight slope so that when there is rainfall, the rainfall will be directed away from the building rather than pooling within the structure itself. For the same kind of reason, in area J, which is here, you can see the stones of the ancient building on buildings on the left there and in the slide above. For that same reason, this serpentine dry stone wall was, was um, constructed by Dimitris and Costis in order that when the rainwater flows down the slope, area J is on the lower side of a slope that comes from the top of the, the central part of Zagora, so that when rain comes down the hill, it's not going to flow straight onto the ancient buildings, that it's going to be diverted away from those structures and therefore not cause damage. I put this slide in to show you the process from excavation through to conservation. So at the top there you've got the temple, the archaic temple, as it was excavated by Professor Kambitoglu's team um, some 40 odd years ago. As over the decades, nature had moved in, we're looking on the interior of the temple here. This is the altar. Nature has very clearly moved in. You can see the plants growing right up and even into. We actually had to move. Already we've removed plants from growing inside the altar there. Through to the conservation actually taking place. And the reason that these cloths, these sacking cloths have been laid onto the walls is that once the mortar is put in place, the more slowly it dries, the more um, strongly it will uh, survive for many, many years to come. So they were attempting to slow down the drying process of the mortar as it was placed into the building. And then through to how the temple looked when the conservation had been completed, which I hope you will agree has brought it back 
to its original state as far as possible. And again, another slide of a slightly different kind to show you the state of the uh, temple here viewed from the interior before we began the conservation through to this wonderful ortho photo by Hugh Thomas. It's actually that same wall, but it's viewed from the other side, from the exterior of how that wall appeared once the conservation had taken place. And I think you'll agree it's a splendid result. And then finally, um, I mentioned before that Costis and Dimitris had a generator on site to be able to fire up their concrete mixer. Now, that concrete mixer was needed primarily for the construction of modern fence post bases. And this was because as part of, not as part of our proposal, but as part of the Central Archaeological Council's approval of the proposal we had put forward, we were asked to erect a fence around the conserved areas of the site. Now, we did have some problems with that. We had some problems with that request, first and foremost, because what we knew we couldn't do was sink fence bases into the earth around, for example, here, the temple. Because as uh, Professor Kambitoglu mentioned in his introduction, such a small percentage of the site still to date has been excavated that you can't go digging holes willy-nilly into the site because you're going to damage something that's unexcavated. So we provided our feedback to the Greek Ministry of Culture, to the authorities, and said, look, we just can't. We understand your request, but we can't do it the way we've been asked to do it because there's a danger of further destruction. So what we've done is a trial, a pilot, because we were given permission to create a superficial fence, a fence that does not penetrate the earth. And you might be thinking, well, how on earth do you put up a fence that isn't dug into the earth? Well, Costis and Mimitris constructed fence post base, bases, which were essentially concrete blocks, but bless them, to make them blend in with the environment, they faced these concrete post bases with schist blocks so that they look as though they're ancient. And then the fence that you can see here was anchored to these post bases sitting above the ground. Whether it will work, we don't know. It's a trial, it's a pilot. It may be in the fierce, fierce winds that blow across that side <laughs> that, that that fence is going to blow down, in which case we'll have to revisit uh, that whole dilemma. The reason that the Greek Ministry of Culture asked us to do this is, in essence, to keep the goats and the sheep out. There's a flip side to that argument, though. And again, this is where the pilot nature of that fencing of the area will tell uh, in time. <laughs> goats and sheep no, we don't want them because they're not good for the structures. Although now the structures have been stabilized, there would certainly be less damage. But goats and sheep are great because they do eat vegetation. So we'll have to see in 12 months' time, particularly on the interior of the temple, to what degree nature has been able to move back in. Because if the goats and the sheep have been providing some kind of vegetation control, then again, this is something we need to think about. Something in the future that we very much want to do, apart from conserving Area J and the gates through the ancient fortification wall, is also to further that work of public archaeology that I talked about before, the education and the information side of presenting the site to those who go to visit. Because when we're not there, it's a very, very hard site to understand. It's huge. And unless you know what you're looking at, unless you've got the guidebook um, in your hand, it's a very difficult site to make sense of. 
So what we would like to do at some point in the future is to be able to install on the site information panels. But those information panels are going to have to be of a very substantial kind that are not going to be blown over by the wind. So, for example, putting information panels on the fence, which you would think would be a very sensible thing to do, probably wouldn't work because they would probably not survive too long. What I would like to do in order to finish is to play you a short video, it's about seven minutes long, that Irma Havlicek, our wonderful uh, documenter, who's been uh, in charge of our blog on the Powerhouse website, she has put together a terrific video about the conservation of the site. And I think it just kind of pulls together many of the things that I have been saying in this presentation. So if you just bear with me. So here we have Zagara. You can see the size, the huge size of the site. Stephanie again. You can see the plants actually growing between the stones there. Listen to that wind. Not unusual. <laughs> oh no, it's effective, I think. This is where they're comparing the original images with what's left. Jigsaw. That's the plan she's holding that great big book. And again, 
getting it to dry slowly, the mortar to dry slowly. <coughs> You can imagine how painstaking and time-consuming it is working with every single stone along the wall. So the post holes are actually in these concrete blocks that are going to sit above the ground. There they are. Look at that wonderful, <laughs> oh, missed it. wonderful adding of schist on the outside. Thank you, Irma. 